the WBO welterweight champion of the world, Terrence Bud Crawford, number one pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world. And we will see him July 29th, Showtime pay-per-view. Champ, it's good to have you. There are a number of media people who got questions for you. We're going to get right into them. But first, if you could give us a word on how training camp has been going. We saw, got a little peek of it in all access, but we want to know, what has it been like? We've seen you've been working out. Uh, Shakur obviously has been there in camp. We want to know up in there, have you been wrestling with bears or whatever? What have you done different uh, for a fight of this magnitude that maybe you haven't done in the past? To be honest, training camp has been going great and there's nothing changed. You know, um, we real firm believers in if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, so we've been doing the same thing. If you can, but give, give me your thoughts on this fight. In your opinion, what does this fight do for the legacy of Bud Crawford and more importantly, the sport of boxing? Well, like I've been saying, this 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 fight right here just put a stamp on everything that I've accomplished in the sport of boxing. Um, a lot of people been discrediting me and for my opponents and when I fought them and how I performed and this and that and that and this. And a lot of people been calling for the Errol Spence, Terrence Crawford fight. So I think this fight is just put a stamp on everything. Hmm. And this fight is what boxing needs. Uh, there's been a lot of fights in the history of boxing that didn't come to fruition that a lot of fans was calling for years. And for whatever reason, those fights wasn't able to get made, but this was a fight that was able to get made and it's happening at the right time. And the fans is going to enjoy a great fight come July 29th. But if, if you could uh, uh, make a, a comparison, I know I remember at the, at, at the press conference, one of the things I said, I said, this is a super fight. This is, this is, you know, Leonard Hearns. This is uh, Leonard Hagler. This is Hagler Hearns. Um, this is Duran Leonard. If, if you could compare one of those fights, what, which one of those fights does this compare to in your opinion? I don't know. I, th I think style-wise, I would say Leonard Hagler. Hmm. Uh, I was I would say that would be a fight that you can compare it to. But like I've been saying to everybody, a lot of people ask me that question, and I tell tell them the same thing. Like this is Terrence Crawford versus Errol Spence, because at the end of the day, that's who they are gonna be talking about in the in the future. They are not gonna be talking about, oh man, that was like Leonard Hackler. That was like Hearns and Hagler. No, they are gonna be talking about, man, Crawford and Spence. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, you know, what, one of the things that uh, uh, he, uh, Errol had talked about, he said, listen, it means something when you have fought all of these top guys uh in their prime and i had to take things away from them he hasn't done that and that's what I, that's what i'm going to show on this night that you know i've i've fought the top guys and i've taught i've fought them in their prime and that's what's going to help me in a fight like this how, what about you how, how do you respond to that well that's that's his mental that's what he believes in but there's only one one fighter that he, not even one fighter, all those fighters had a loss. So they already had something took from them. So him going into to fight somebody that had something took for him, they already knew how to lose. When I took things from fighters, I took they belt, I took they, they owe, I took a lot from them. I took their mental. They never was the same. They never performed the same. 
So I can say the same, but you know, that's his mental. That's how, what he believe in. And come fight night, he's going to have to prove that. Hmm. I asked him this question. I'll ask you the same thing. I said, you know, and I told him, I said, Errol, I don't know if you've ever faced anyone as athletic who switches like Bud Crawford has knockout power uh, like Bud Crawford. In your opinion, champ, this fight will boil down to what? I would think this fight will boil down to who prepared the best and uh, on on fight night, who's on a A plus game. That's what it's going to boil down to. Hmm. I love that. I love that. Um, w- when you look at this fight, obviously there uh, a, a rematch clause from whomever uh, takes an L. Do you think the rematch would be at one forty seven or one fifty four? I don't know. I'm not like I said. I'm not focusing on on the rematch i plan to win the first match so the rematch is not even in my mind right now i'm more so focused on the job at hand right now yeah yeah uh you you got a chance to i'm sure watch all access uh the first episode would you like i watched a little bit of it It was cool it was cool to see myself on there and see the team and you know uh see my kids and so it was cool. You, you have, and for those members of the media who don't, you have some extremely talented children um, from track to wrestling to everything. Do, do they grasp the enormity of this fight and how big this fight is? And what are their feelings? Of course, of course. My kids, they've been in it since since babies. They all in it, you know. Uh, for years, even hearing my kids like, Daddy, is you gonna fight that Spencer guy? <laughs> Spence. Well, yeah, Errol Spence, is you gonna fight him? Like, yeah. Then here go my son, Dad, when you fight him, I'm coming to that fight. I don't care, I'm coming. So like, I, I get it from my family, I get it from my kids, I get it from the fans. Everybody want this fight. Everybody, this is the fight that the whole world that follows boxing wanted. And when you hear from your kids, like they always watching YouTube and they see their dad name come up, you know, they always asking you like, man, I got to fight this dude. I got to figure out a way how to fight this dude. Because when you got your kids asking you when you're going to fight this dude, then, you know, you, you know, you got to fight them. Um, When you look at your career and you've done some, phenomenal things um when you talk about the number of weight divisions that you've conquered to be undisputed already that you've already done that at 140 it, it even, look if you if you hung it up today you know you would be a hall of famer but is there a part of you that that would have said i don't know if the my career would have been complete had i not fought this guy so is, is this the the capper when you talk about what you've done in your career. Yeah, you can say that, but at the same time, I don't think I would I would think my career wasn't complete if me and Earl didn't fight for the fact of uh, the matter things happen. I try, I try, I try to get the fight done in a, in the past for whatever reason it didn't happen, but it's here now and we don't gotta worry about me asking them questions to myself later on down the line because we're here. So all that, what if, it doesn't matter no more. Last, my last question, I'll let members of the media come right in. I know everywhere I go, everyone asked me about this fight. And even before we got made, is it gonna get made? What is it like for you now? When you, when you go to the store, when you go to the barber shop, what do they say? Oh, they, they're just saying the same thing. Like, man, I'm glad y'all got that fight done. But man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. Them tickets is hard in the mud. You know, I'll be like, man, you got to support. You know, y'all y'all spend crazy money on other, you know, crazy stuff that really doesn't, doesn't even matter. But a fight that y'all been yearning for, y'all been trying to force the action and – uh. Y'all coming up with these narratives, oh, this guy's scared or he's scared or 
he's ducking or he's ducking or they don't want to fight each other. And they, they just came up with all sorts of lies and all this crazy stuff. But now that the fight here, people want to have excuses. People want to complain, support the fight, you know, yeah. because this is this is how me and Errol feed our family. We the one that got to go in there and put our lives on the line. And, you know, uh, if anything happened, nobody's there to take care of us. Nobody's there to pick us up. Only thing they dare to do is laugh at us. They're they dare to write on the internet, oh, you got knocked out or you got beat up or you this and that. They don't never pick these fighters up. You know, they they there for the ride, and then when the ride slows down, they hop off. Or when the ride stops, they hop off and then they hop on another ride. So, you know, support the fighters, man. I love it. And how you can support them, make sure, as I said at the top. Uh, tickets axs.com again they are there's only a few left you got to make sure this is a sellout axs.com or showtime pay-per-view showtime pay-per-view make sure you order uh the fight were you tripped out that he knew that you didn't like hot sauce no no so so i it, it caught me off guard and i'm like how you know i don't like hot sauce you know what I mean? And then a lot of my people's they was like, man, you said that in the interview. You said that. You know what I mean? He must have he must have heard you say it. And I was like, oh, all right, all right. Because I was like, man, he's got a mole. And, and right, I, right. Oh. I like, man, how, how this dude know I don't like hot sauce? He's going to have to tighten up that gang that you had around you. I love it. All right. I know there are a number of people that got questions for you, but uh, let me bring in Andrew Roberts again from Swanson Communications. Andrew, uh, please let the members of the media ask the champ some questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and as a reminder to all the media, if you have a question, please hit the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen there. Our first question is going to come from Keith Idick with Boxing Scene. Keith, please unmute yourself and you can ask your questions. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Terrence, thanks for taking the time, man. Appreciate it. Um, you uh, Obviously, it's all business. July 29th, you're, you're both beasts. You're going to try to take each other's heads off and everything. Of course, there's a respect for one another, but you you two guys seem to like each other. Is that fair from the outside looking in? That's the way that it seems. Is that a fair assessment of it? Well, I say we respect each other. You know, uh, we haven't been around each other to hang out with each other, party with each other. So I just think it's a mutual respect uh, for one another. How well, you know, because you guys had these phone calls with each other and such, how much better did you get to know him in that way that you probably had never done with any other opponent? Well, like it's the same, you know. We 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 had the phone calls that we had the the make the biggest fight in boxing uh, to date, May, and that's you know what we did. We both understood the assignment. We both had had the same goal and dreams in mind, and we just came together and made sure that we both was was man enough and uh, mature enough to get the get the fight made. Terrence, I know you said you want to focus on the first fight and not the rematch, but if you beat him in the way that I'm sure you feel that you will, either decisively by decision or stoppage, do you feel that he will want a rematch based on the way that you think you're going to beat him? Well, that's that's on him. Like I said, that's that wouldn't have nothing to do with me. Uh, that would be something that I have to do with him. Like, like I said, like I'm going in July 29th, 100% focused mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and ready to win the first fight. I'm not thinking about uh, a rematch or second fight or any of that at this point in time. My last question for you, Terrence, is why do you think that he has uh, tried to diminish your win against Sean Porter in the way that he has? And what is your uh, retort to that? Well, you got to understand, you know, um, a lot of fighters and a lot of people have been doing that to Terrence Crawford for a long time now. So it's it's nothing new. That's kind of like a seesaw effect. They see one person discredit me for one fighter and then they see another person and then that's just the thing to do. And then now you hear a lot of people on, on, on the media saying, oh, well, Crawford ain't fought nobody. Crawford ain't fought nobody. That's the narrative now. If you uh look at the comments or you know any anything that's posted on instagram or 
on Twitter, they all say the same thing. Oh, Crawford ain't fought nobody. So I'm used to it. And I just laugh because there's always an excuse after an L. All right. Thank you, Terrence. And thank you for those questions, Keith. Uh, next up, Andrew Jones with Anscape. Andrew, if you could please unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Thanks, other Andrew, as always. C Carl Broad, appreciate you as always, my man. Want to ask you with, Ch with Coach Chet and his personality, what's the most entertaining or funny thing that he said? And is he or B Mac the funniest guy or funniest person in camp? And also, you said on with um, Sean Porter's show that you felt the promotion because you and Errol don't do crazy antics all over, that the promotion hasn't probably been as high as you thought. But 1.1 million views and growing for all access and a lot of people responding to it and appreciating it. Do you feel differently now about how this fight's being promoted? Okay, so there's a lot of people in camp that's funny. I mean, everybody had their own personalities, everybody funny in their own right. So uh, Chet, Chet and Bo, yes, they have their moments, but there's a lot of people in here that have their mo moments as well. And uh, the promotion, like I said, the promotion is, is is going great. And the only reason why I say that it could be bigger is because when when you go outside and you 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 see somebody that does doesn't know anything about boxing, they really don't know the fight is going on. That's what I mean by it could be bigger. Diehard boxing fans, people that's into boxing. Yes, they all know about the fight. They all been wanting the fight. They all been calling for the fight. But if I go to my next door neighbor's grandma house that doesn't watch boxing, if she don't read the newspaper and we ain't in the newspaper, then is she going to know who I am? That's what I mean by, you know, it could be bigger on different outlets, I would say. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Our next question is going to come from Robert Latal with Black Sports Online. Robert, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Uh, good talking to you again, uh, Bud. Uh, Earl uh, spoke about kind of what you just spoke about in the sense that, you know, you guys are not on stage uh, slapping each other. You guys are not, uh, you know, pulling type of crazy stuff, cursing at each other and things of that nature. How important is it, do you believe, when you have two African-American fighters who are family men, uh, who are respectful towards each other, how is it important is it that the numbers when they do come in as far as the ticket sales and the pay-per-view that we show support for each other with a fight like this? It's very important because this is how mega fights get made. Uh, if, if, if these fighters uh, doesn't feel they value or their worth has been uh, honored by the fans that we put our life on the line, then those big fights that everybody wants is not going to get made because the money is not going to be there. So this is how big fights get made. And once you see a trend of the support of fans, not the ones that's streaming and uh, still in the paper views, the ones that's actually supporting the event and paying for it and supporting it, then that's where you're going to start getting so many uh mega fights that everybody wanted to see. And the second question that I had for you, with a fight like this that has so much anticipation, how important is it to you to put on a show uh, for the fans? So like you said, they are talking about it 10, 20 years from now, or is just the most important thing is just following the game plan, uh, getting the W, and how do you kind of balance that out when you know when that bell ring, everyone is going to be looking, you know, they've been talking Hagler hers and, and all of this type of stuff. They're looking for that type of fight. How do you stay in that zone and also, you know, make it a good show for everybody who did pay to, to, to see it? The objective is always to get the win, first and foremost. But if you've been following Errol Spence's career and you've been following Terrence Crawford, career you got two exciting fighters that's always an exciting fight so there's there's not a doubt in my mind that this fight will be and will be exciting all right thank you robert 
Our next question is going to come from Hans Themistod with Fight Hype. Hans, please mute yourself. If you can ask your question. Hey, Terrence, how you feeling, man? What's up, man? All right. So, first question for you. Um, Errol came on here and he said that you know he needed you. He needed this fight. Um, you are pretty much the ultimate dance partner. Um, before the fight got made, you were always just on some. Look, I don't need him. I don't need this fight. Um, you know, I guess frustrated or whatever. But now that the fight is here, can you look back and say, uh, nah, I was wrong. I really did need Arrow. I did need this fight. This is the biggest fight in like the past 30 years or something like that. Well, I wouldn't say Arrow is my biggest dance partner, like he said, yes. So being that, being the magnitude of this fight, the stage of this fight, the level, everything. Yes, I need it. Everything that's surrounding this fight and that's on the line with this one fight. Yes, I need an Earl. But far as career wise, legacy wise, I didn't need an Earl because I already accomplished so much in the sport of boxing that I can retire right now and be in the Hall of Fame and ride in the sunset and be comfortable with what I've accomplished in the sport of boxing because there's nothing that I haven't accomplished in the sport of boxing that would would hinder me from saying, oh, man, dang, I wish I would have did this or I wish I would have did that. I already became undisputed. I already won SB Award. I already was fighter of the year. I was already multiple world champions in different weight, weight classes. I was already two-time linear uh, uh, fighter in two different weight class. So, you know, this is, like I said, this is just a cherry on top of my ice cream. Gotcha. And um, um, my, my next question for you is, um, you know, you're the type of guy that, you know, when you're at 35, 40, and now 47, you were always either looking at who's the top guy here that I haven't fought yet, or Who's like a guy that's like under me or making his way up? Like, damn, this dude could fight. So we got Jerron Ennis, man. And I know you're focused on Errol Spence, but it's like every time Jerron fights, this dude is just whooping everybody, you know? And Floyd has praised him. Um, Leonard Ellaby has praised him. Roy Jones has praised him. You're focused completely on Errol. But do you look at Jerron and say, yo, look, man, I, I – I got to fight this dude. He fighting his ass off. Everybody praising him. I, that's a dude I need to fight maybe after the rematch. I always, I always said uh, Boots was, was, was a great talent. I always told everybody that I supported them. I've been supporting them since he was in the amateurs when he was fighting Gary Russell. You know, um, I always, always supported them because they always said he remind uh, them so much of me. But seeing him you know i kind of see myself in him and yes he he deserved he deserved a title shot he deserved it all you know but you know his time will come but right now you know business is business all right thank you hans our next question is going to come from ben baby with espn ben please unmute yourself and you can ask your question Awesome. Thanks, Andrew, and I appreciate you, Terrence, for taking the time. Uh, to kind of piggyback on one of those questions earlier, uh, would you feel if if this fight doesn't go your way, I mean, would you would you still feel like you were the best welterweight of your era without a win? Do you need this win, you know, as much as all the things you've accomplished in your career, do you need this win to kind of to feel like you were the best welterweight of your era, and does that matter to you at all? Of course. Of course, it's always about the win. It's always about uh, beating the, the the top guys in the division. I can't I can't say I'm the best guy in my era when there's still one guy at the at Mount Rushmore sitting beside me. I got to be up there by myself. So of course, this fight uh, matters. Of course, I need to win this fight. Uh, if not, then you know we got to go back to the drawing boards and you know come back stronger. 
how concerned are you about the size difference? Uh, what, uh, you know, I've got one more question after this, but you know, the size difference is going to be a lot of conversation about how big Arrow usually is. The fact he can still make 147, you, you were undisputed in, at 140. How have you kind of managed that and prepared for what that difference might look like on fight night? I don't worry about it. Listen, when you, when you talk about size, you, you, you talk about Jeff Horn. They said Jeff Horn was one of the biggest welterweights uh, other than Spence. When you talk about uh, size, you talk about Sean Porter. You know, me and Sean Porter was in the amateurs together. I was at 132, he was at 165. You know, uh, Benavidez, he was a big welterweight. Um, I don't know, like I'm always fighting big welterweights. So that's nothing new. I'm always the smaller guy. Even when I was at 140, I was a smaller guy. You know, 35, I might was tall, but I was the smaller guy. So being a smaller guy, you know, never made me think, oh, man, this guy is too big or not. It's cool. The bigger they is, the harder they fall. Right, right. And, and last one for me, um, you know, Errol talked about, you know, the 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 amount of belts and, and how there are too many belts. And it's something that we're looking at as well. Um, you know, he said that there's he made an interesting point that there's a responsibility upon fighters to kind of help limit maybe the amount of belts and maybe reduce the amount of titles. What what can fighters do, fighters who are at their at the peak of the sport like y'all do to help maybe kind of streamline some of these belts and eliminate some of these, you know, secondary and tertiary belts? I don't know. It's kind of hard because you got to understand when you coming up, everybody want to be a world champion. Everybody want to be a world champion. So a lot of people, uh, get get it confused when they see all these fighters with belts and these fighters saying oh i'm a world champion or i'm a champion and this and that and i got the wbc diamond or the interim this or the interim that and it's like okay but what about this guy or what about this guy he got a belt or he got a belt you know um but it's it's it's, it's kind of not like it's they fault because you got the champion, the champion may be hurt and um, they want to get a shot at a, at a title and the champion might be hurt and they may say, OK, well, you can fight for this interim title. But when the champion back, then you get a shot. Then when the champion come back, then he get to do other things. It's up to the sanction bodies to, you know, have a have a model to where this guy got to fight this guy no matter what coming back no money or nothing or he got to drop the belt or he got to fight his mandatory no matter what or he got to drop the belt because if you notice a lot of people they be mandatory and they'll never really get their shot because you get to do other things you know uh when you got Jamar Charlo, he's still a champion. He ain't fought in over, what, two, two, two years? You know, stuff like that, like hogging up the belt. But you got Canelo, he going up and down weights, you know. Uh, and there's people at 168 want to fight for titles. So I think it needs to be more structure with these sanction bodies uh, to where other people can get opportunities to fight for these titles because that's what it's all about. Or they need to cancel all of them and just make it one one champion and one division, kind of like the UFC. All right, thank you, Terrence. Thank you for those questions, Ben. Our next question is gonna come from Dan Rayfield of Big Fight Weekend. Dan, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Hello, Terrence. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate sure. your time very much. Uh, you were talking about all of your various accomplishments earlier as far as uh, that you didn't necessarily have to have this fight with Errol because of, uh, you know, you could go on and have a great legacy and be in the Hall of Fame and all that business. But if you win this fight, you will be the first uh, bo male boxer anyway of the four belt era to be undisputed in two different weight classes. That's a big deal, it seems to me. And I wonder when you think about that in relation to all the other accomplishments that you've had, and you mentioned fighter of the year and, you know, multiple division champion, lineal champions, all that business. Where do you think being the first ever guy to do that, meaning when all four belts be undisputed in two weight classes, 
where would you rank that on your list of, uh, you know, many, many accomplishments in your career? Man, it'd be up there. It'd be up there. It'd be top three for sure. You know, like I said, I don't think nothing is going to outdo the accomplishment that I accomplished by winning uh, my first title in Scotland against Ricky Burns. I think that still is going to hold a, a a big a big spot, a big number one spot in my heart. Uh, yeah, but this is going to be a great fight, and it's going to be a great feeling walking away with all those belts and becoming the first male boxer in the four belt era to actually win all four titles in two different divisions back to back. Um, I, I I feel like I started I started this trend of these fighters want to become under undisputed. Uh, if you look when I before I came before I became undisputed, look what Bernard Hopkins, Jermaine Taylor, you know that was way back then, you know. Uh, so that was a great accomplishment. But now you see it more frequently. You see it more. You see it happening more often, and uh, that's a great thing. And I think it's going to lead to a lot of fights be being made and a lot of fighters challenging themselves and daring themselves to be great to try to accomplish the same thing. When this fight was uh, being negotiated, and we all know what happened last fall, people thought maybe it was on, it didn't happen. You ended up taking your fight with David Evanesian. You all came back to the table. Uh, and it was a difficult negotiation, and obviously everybody is very happy that the fight is now going to happen. But I wonder, at the time it was taking place, and you were going back and forth with Errol, you mentioned about the phone calls and that sort of thing. Can you, from your perspective of making the deal, what was the one thing that finally sort of put you over the top and said, at least in your mind, you know, we're good to go, and I'm satisfied, and this fight's going to happen? Because, you know, it was seemed touch and go, at least from those of us watching the thing unfold on the outside. What was it that put it over the edge for you that said, you know what? This is going to happen. It's me calling Errol. That's it. Me calling him and going directly to him instead of going through uh, uh, other people. It just took me calling him and us, you know, talking as men and coming to the agreement. And that's really how the fight got made and how I was sure that the fight was going to get made and how I was comfortable that the fight was about to happen. All right, thank you for those questions, Dan. Uh, next up, Marcus Hayes for Fight Hub TV. Marcus, please unmute yourself. You can ask your question. Hey, what's up, TC? Thank you for your time, man. Marcus Hayes with Fight Hub. So, Terrence, uh, with all that's been said and assumed by the fans and the pundits uh, alike about you potentially having ducked Errol Smith Jr. What part of this, what part of this are you looking forward to the most? If you had to pick? I'm just looking for the fight, looking towards the fight. Like I pretty much don't entertain the people that say foolishness, things like that. Uh Crawford Duncan Spence or Spence Duncan Crawford and things like that. I don't, I don't pay attention to things like that because. I've been fighting since I was seven years old and I ain't dug nobody. Errol Spence been fighting all his life and he ain't, I'm pretty sure he haven't dug anyone either. Uh, when you coming up in the amateurs, you fighting the best of the best for free, fighting everybody, you know? So uh, this is what we do. This is what, you know, uh, we love to do. This is how we feed our family. So it wasn't in a case of, just sign a contract or you ducking. When the business was right, then you got to fight. You guys have been largely uh, friendly during the promotion uh, when you guys see each other. Um, how far out of the window does that go on fight night, Terrence? Oh, we definitely ain't friends on a fight night. Like that's, that's ludicrous. I was, I was friends with Sean Porter, I mean, you see how that fight went. I was friends with Ray Beltran. You see how that fight went. Uh, 
I was cool with a lot of uh, fighters, you know, uh, respectful to to the fighters that's respectful to me. But at the same time, when when the bell ring, ain't no friends in the ring. You trying to you trying to knock me out. I'm trying to knock you out. You know, one one sp small blow in the wrong spot can end my life. That's how I look at it. So you trying to end my life. We're not friends. All right. Thank you, Terrence. And thank you for those questions, Marcus. Uh, next up, Jandra LaBeouf with Best Women's Box Show, period. Jandra, please unmute yourself. You can ask your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Terrence, for your time. I noticed that during the All Access, you know, we saw a lot of the Cowboys. I know that you are a big Packers fan. What is the connection between fighters and football players? Because it seems like all of you connect to football players more so than any sport. Could you just talk a little bit about if there is a connection between football and fighters and how participating in that sport can help you in the ring? Uh, I just like football because I played football, you know, uh, played basketball. I did all those sports, but the connection to football and basketball is both, both sports get their brains rattled. <laughs> so, so I think that's the, the only connection, you know, like the aggressiveness, you know, the, the mentality of going out there and, you know, uh, putting it all on the field, putting it all in the ring. Uh, then at the end of the day, you walk around with, you walk away from the field or the fight with a couple of loose screws. Do the loose screws make you better or <laughs> make you worse in the long run in terms of ferocity in the ring? Oh man, it depends on how many screws you get loose. <laughs> some, some some football players last a year in the, in the NFL. Some last a little bit more. Some fighters last uh, a few years in professional boxing. Some last a few more. So it just depends on how good your defense is. All right, thank you, Terrence. Thank you, Jandra. All right, we got time for a couple more here. Uh, next up, Mark Lowenwala for Front Office Sports. So mute yourself and you can ask your question. Hey, Terrence, with all the mutual respect between you and Errol, um, how refreshing would it be for boxing if this fight cracks the top five gross, um, top five gr highest grossing boxing fights of all time, just based off of skills that it doesn't need any verbal mud slinging between y'all? I think that would be great. And I think it'd be great for the sport of boxing, for the sport of all combat sports, because then it would show uh, a level of respect that doesn't have to be aligned with disrespect to be entertaining. I feel like, you know, uh, a lot of people see Mayweather, a lot of people see Ali, they see uh, Mike Tyson, and they feel as if, all right, man, I got to be this villain or I got to be like this guy or I got to be like that guy to 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 sell fights or or to sell pay-per-views and not my skills. But when people start understanding the sport uh, and they understand that you don't have to talk about somebody's dead people uh, in a grave to get them mad and then they start talking about your mama and then they start bringing up personal uh remarks to what you said to them and then y'all make it personal just to sell fights i think it can be a, a, a level of playing field where y'all both respect each other enough to you know respect each other but let each other know that come fight night you know y'all coming for each other head you know, you talked a few minutes ago about the power of just picking up the phone and, and reaching out to Errol for fighters who are stuck in a negotiation rut. Uh, do you encourage them to do the same thing? Well, yeah, it depends on the fight. You know, so they got to they gotta both want it. You know, if, if one fighter wants one thing and the other fighter wants something different, then it's not going to happen. In this case, Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford wanted the same uh, thing. You know, we wanted to become undisputed. We wanted to fight each other just to prove to ourselves that we're the best in the division and number one pound for pound fighter in the world because 
I, like I said, whoever win this fight is undisputed without a doubt, number one fighter in the world, pound for pound. So there was a lot of things on the line that Earl Spence believed in himself that he can be Terrence Crawford. And Terrence Crawford believed that he can be Earl Spence. So us getting on the phone was was like, you know, hey, what's up, man? You know, let's 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 get this done. Not, hey, you wanna fight me? Or come on, man, or you know, stuff like that, like begging or anything. It was just us coming to an agreement. All right. Thank you for those questions, Mark. Our last media questions for Terrence are going to come from Aaron Tolentino with KRON4 in the Bay Area. Aaron, please unmute yourself. You can ask your questions. Hi, Terrence. How are you doing? Um, Aaron Tolentino from Con4 TV here. Um, I wanted to ask, um, you've been undisputed before at 140 pounds. Does being undisputed in this weight class mean more just given the history of it? Just, you know, thinking about who's been champion in this weight class throughout history. I wouldn't say it means more in that sense, but I would say it means more for who I'm becoming undisputed against. When you look at when you look at Arrow, he's considered top five pound for pound on a on a pound for pound list. Uh, he's a he's a fighter that uh, being dominant in his his career. He's a he's a fighter that's you know being considered one of the best opponents that I have faced, if not the best. So there's a lot on this on the on 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 this pound for pound list that you know you could say was different with Ndango. Ndango, yes, Ndango had three titles, you know, back to back to back. Earl had three titles. You know, so we don't we don't consider the IBS, you know, as much as the other four titles, but no, the the IBO, I would say. We don't consider the IBO uh, title as much as we consider the other four, but, you know, and Dongo, he went to two countries and did what he did to uh, those, those champions and then dared to be great to come to his third consecutive country and fight me I, I felt as if that was that was big you know especially you know the Ricky Burns fight then knocking out Troy Noski but then you you look at it and you say oh well Ndongo wasn't nothing you know but you go to Arrow and then he fought the guys that he fought you know and he accomplished what he accomplished but then but the magnitude of this fight is on two whole totally different levels. So I would say yes, this 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 undisputed fight is is bigger in a sense of what's all on the line for me and what's on the line for him as well. Now, one more question. Uh I have um Errol's been on the record that he cuts, you know, 20, 30 pounds just to make 147. He's quote unquote the big welterweight. Could you give us could you give us an insight on how much weight you need to cut and if you feel like at all you might be outgrowing the weight class. I gotta cut like five pounds, man. <laughs> I cut like five pounds, man. Good. I'm good on weight. All right. Thank you for those questions, Aaron. And thank you to all the media that joined us today. Um, thank you very much, Terrence, for your time and Errol as well. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Brian to wrap things up for us. Absolutely. Champ, man, we really appreciate it. Again, you're going to see this man on July 29th. Showtime, pay-per-view, T-Mobile Arena, Las Vegas. The broadcast is going to begin at 8 o'clock. Uh, that is Eastern. It is 5 o'clock Pacific time. Order Showtime, pay-per-view. Or if you want to come out to Las Vegas, the tickets are few. But you can get them at AXS.com. And again, this event is being promoted by Man Down Promotions, TBC Promotions, TGB Promotions as well. Uh, but before I let you go, if you would give members of the media a final comment here on what they're going to see, what they're going to get July 29th on Showtime Pay-Per-View. Man, I appreciate everybody taking the time out to do this uh, little virtual press conference. Uh, I assure you, 
that each and every one of you will see fireworks. Like you said, come out, support the event, buy it on Showtime pay-per-view if you can't make it there in person. But you might want to do both so you can see it in person, then see it when you go home. Because like I said before, I'm going to gut them, I'm going to fillet them, I'm going to take them out the water, and I'm going to suffocate them. There it is. And that's from the unbeaten WBO welterweight champion of the world, Terrence Bud Crawford. Champ, appreciate you. Look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you, members of the media, for joining us today. We will see you July 29th from T-Mobile Arena, Las Vegas, on Showtime Pay-Per-View. I'm Brian Custer. Have a great afternoon.